Good evening all and welcome. Tonight we're going to be heading into the forest for some tales of park rangers. But before we do, I have a huge announcement. We've been working hard behind the scenes and trying to make something awesome for you guys. And it's ready. We are launching new merch tomorrow. So be sure to check out the link to Teespring in the description tomorrow for its launch. Here are a sampling of the products, which we're going to sell. I think they're awesome. I love them. And we've taken a lot of love and care in making them. So, you know, feel free to get them if you want. And um, by this point, I think all old designs have been purged except the classic Mortis Media shirt. But these designs probably won't stick around forever. So when they're launched, be sure to get them if you want them. Because I have more merch ideas coming soon. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I worked for years as an anti-poaching ranger slash ecologist and field guide throughout Africa. From guiding in Kruger National Park to tranquilizing elephants near Mount Kilimanjaro and leading anti-poaching patrols in the Okavango Delta of Angola. I've seen and done a lot. I've seen infinite amounts of beauty and good but also my fair share of civil unrest and war, murders, firefights and animal attacks, wildfires and more. Despite all the things I have experienced, one of the creatures that unsettled me the most during my time in the bush was the leopard. The following is why. Near the beginning of my career, I worked in a large national park in the KwaZulu Natal province of South Africa. The foothills of the Drakensberg Mountains began here and climbed until you reached the border of Lesotho to the west. The park teemed with wildlife, elephants, rhino, African painted wolves and more. But in the shadows and canopies of the foothill, crevasses of the cliffs and wet areas of the lowlands, the elusive leopard prowled. Stories about these big cats were pounded into our heads and training by the older guides. Never make eye contact with one, or you'll be dead before you know what you saw. Oi, you're right screwed if you get on them. They dig their claws into your stomach and rip your guts out. That is, if they don't come up behind you and get you by the neck. So needless to say, those of us working in the remote bush always kept our eyes peeled, ears focused and rifles loaded. I remember few things more terrifying than walking through dense forest at night, waiting to catch two eyes in your flashlight shine, staring down at you. I never did end up on the business side of a leopard, but I searched for those who did. The area's biggest industry was tourism. Every year, thousands, likely hundreds of thousands or more, streamed into the parks, hoping to capture photos, memories and knickknacks. As a result, Many local and foreign people became guides, hoping to find their fortune guiding these high paying folks on expensive trips. One of these men was an Afrikaner by the name of Axel. He was a goofy but friendly enough fellow who would cruise around in his 1980s Toyota Land Cruiser, packed with tourists. However, he was notorious for breaking the rules. He would drive off trail, get closer to the animals than what was permitted, and have a terrible addiction to tobacco, which pushed him up to the light, even during dry season, when the entire park was a tinderbox. Given my position as a ranger and ecologist at the time, I had many different interactions with Axel, mostly revolving around his misconduct. Despite this, I liked the guy, his personality was great, and you could always rely on him for a cigarette and a light from his black Zippo lighter during wet season, of course. During the wet season, a deep and narrow creek cascades down from the foothills and flows into the park's largest wetland area. About a mile from the wetland, a large concrete and iron bridge offered transport over the river's raging waters. It was dry season when Alex parked his tourist-filled land cruiser on the bridge, so the creek bed was cracked and bone dry. He let his passengers out, as the view from the bridge to the wetland was phenomenal. He told them to stay put, as he went to take a leak. He 
He walked to the far side of the bridge and disappeared, under the spot where the bridge connected to the top of the berm that slowly sloped 30 feet down to the bottom of the creek bed. The tourists watched him go, then resumed snapping pictures towards the wetland. Suddenly, the call of a grey lorry echoed out. The grey lorry is more commonly known as the grey go-away bird, as it sounds like someone yelling, go away. Whenever us rangers heard the call, we would instantly be on high alert, as we knew the lorry had sensed a predator afoot. Immediately after the lorry's call, the sound of thrashing bush and a muffled scream echoed from the creek. Several tourists darted over to the side of the bridge in time to see a massive leopard bound out from under the bridge, dragging Axel's body by the neck. The grey lorry continued to cry go away, as the leopard and Axel vanished into the dense bush. We arrived an hour after the tourists called for help and took the eyewitness accounts. We then parked our rocks and loaded our rifles to track down the leopard and the guide's body. The first thing we found was a pack of cigarettes and the black Zippo lighter scattered on the ground just under the bridge. He hadn't gone under to urinate, but rather to light up out of sight, as the act was illegal at this time of year. His last act of rule breaking killed him. We followed the blood down the creek bed to where we found a dirty boonie cap. A hundred meters away we found a shoe. Soon enough, the blood trail vanished as did the leper's tracks. The search lasted almost two weeks before it was scaled back and then shut down. Axel was never found. Almost exactly one year after Axel met his fate, I was working on a large reserve in Botswana. The park's biodiversity attracted a great number of visitors every year, many of whom spent the night in luxury lodges and resorts tucked away in the park's borders. Those of us who spend our nights in tents, waiting in ambush for poachers, or monitoring the movements of nocturnal species with infrared binoculars, understood the extreme danger that the African bush conceals. Many of the visitors did not. I had just used Axel Zippo to light a bry when the radio crackled to life. Telling our team to report for a search and rescue to a nearby luxury lodge, we begrudgingly packed away the meat and veggies we'd intended to cook and drove the 20 minutes to the lodge. Outside the lodge, a father and mother cried, attempting to console each other in between gut-wrenching sobs. Two children sat next to each other on the lodge's steps, staring off into the night like they had just come back from the front lines. The other guests were gathered on the steps of their own little yurts, talking lowly amongst each other. As we dismounted the pickup, the night guard walked over to us, his face tight and grim. Leopard got their daughter, he stated in a thick Zulu accent. We told them not to sleep on the balcony. We climbed to the balcony and found a tattered hammock with a massive trail of blood leading off the edge and into the trees. A teenage tourist on vacation from Europe with her family had slept on the open-air balcony of their lodge they'd rented. At night, as the night guard had warned them, a leopard slipped into their camp, climbed a nearby tree onto the lodge's roof, and snatched the young girl in her sleep. Unlike Axel, we found her several hours later, stuffed into a large hole about seven feet up in a tree. That night, we shot the leopard dead as is standard procedure when such an animal begins preying on humans. I have witnessed paranormal events, morti magic, ethnic cleansing, hippo attacks, but nothing disturbed me more than getting snatched up by a predator, never to be seen or heard from again. To this day, when I'm hiking in the woods of the United States, going for a late night run, or taking my dog out to the bathroom, I keep my eyes and lights on the bush, and a hand on my loaded pistol. My cousin is with the Forest Service in the Montana Slush, Wyoming area, and I decided to go up there with her to literally test the waters. She does hydrology and has to ride out to the middle of nowhere 
to test streams and snow runoffs to ensure no contaminants. So I thought that sounded fun and wanted to do a bit of a tour with her. We were going to camp out there for two nights, so we packed all our gear into saddlebags and saddle buddied and started out. The first day and night were amazing. Beautiful scenery and amazing air quality. It really is so peaceful out there. I love the area and wish I could go there more often. We started out on the second day and my cousin said, do you want to see something weird? Of course, I said. So she led me on a bit of a side journey into this tiny little ravine. We ended up traveling about two hours away from our actual path we'd laid out. At the very end of this fold in the land, she dismounts and tells me to get off my horse too. We tie them up in this gorgeous little clearing and she tells me to follow this tiny wildlife path and bring our little rechargeable radio. It is one of those things that you plug in and wind up and also acts as a lantern if you really need it to, but that kills the battery very quickly. I do, and out in the middle of nowhere, there's a huge coil of wire sticking out of the ground. The wire itself was not weirdly large, like some buried transmission wire, but small, like 10 or 12 gauge wiring for a house. It trailed off into the brush and trees, so naturally I decided to follow the damn thing out of curiosity. My cousin trails behind me as I do, and this wire, after coming straight up off the ground, is strung across limbs of trees and then back to the ground. Then it snakes around rocks and finally deadens into an outlet. The outlet is mounted on the side of a desk. It looks like a school teacher's desk from when I was growing up, with a metal base and a pseudo wooden plastic top thing. No chair, no building, no anything. Just this outlet and this desk. I'm starting to get confused as hell as to why this desk is in the middle of a forest. When my cousin takes the radio, pulls out the cord and plugs it into the outlet. Then it started lighting up and blaring static. The wire was being fed from somewhere. Now the place where we were at had no road access, no buildings for many miles and no other people around. And yet, it was a live outlet. Weird as hell. No spooky jump scares or bodies, just one lone powered desk in the middle of the woods. I wish I had snapped a picture. I was in the Gila wilderness and a convoy of us campers slash fishers were making the drive onto the dirt road from Mogollon to Snow Lake when we spotted a forest ranger guy pulled over looking in a ditch. Turns out some idiots tried to make a U-turn and didn't realize the loose rocks makes it hard to stop. They went over the edge and high centered. We're miles from the nearest official campground and it's early spring and the nighttime gets pretty damn cold. We get a Jeep with a winch in position and start to pull the guy out of the ditch. Off a hill comes a white dude in a purple velvet sweatsuit. He's got a walking stick, fanny pack and the velvet sweatsuit, that's it. He's a blonde dude and pretty skinny, and comes up to us and tells us he's German and having a great time. We couldn't get over the purple velvet suit. It was like a real pimp sweatsuit. The ranger is immediately suspicious, wants to know where he's staying and where he came from. It was around nine in the morning, and the only way he couldn't got him where he came from was to hike for hours. The German guy is goofy as hell, and points off towards the other mountain where we asked where he's staying and going. We all think it's funny, but also question how the guy is getting along with no water and no food, as the sun is intense above 5,000 feet, even if it's only 75 degrees. The German guy refuses water or any other help and just crosses the road and goes off into the woods. The ranger told us he can't really keep the guy from doing it since he seemed okay and said he'd check a few campsites in that direction later to see if he made it. We get to Snow Lake and commence drinking like fish in order to catch fish better. That evening, the ranger pops by to tell us that nobody at any campsite had seen the dude. He radioed around and no other rangers had abandoned camps or missing campers, 
and they surely hadn't seen a German dude in a purple pimp sweatsuit. That's strange. The ranger rolled off duty the next day and his replacement came by to make sure the other ranger was smoking something we gave him. We assured him it all happened. Never heard another word about the German guy in the purple pimp sweatsuit, but it makes for a good story. I texted my buddy that was with me to reminisce about the German guy, and he reminded me that he looked a lot like the actor Rise Iffens, who plays Nigel the Kicker in the Keanu Reeves classic The Replacement. Hope that helps with the mental image. The movie came out three years after the camping trip, but we remember seeing the movie and thinking Nigel looked just like the crazy German. As a forest worker, I actually have a few stories that are going to creep you out. The biggest one was in northeastern British Columbia, up near the Alberta border about as far north as Fort Nelson, but no summer roads because it is a giant swamp up there. We flew in with a helicopter and two of us girls got dropped in a block. The helicopter dropped us all first thing in the morning and was coming back in the afternoon because he had another job in the middle. So my partner goes one way to the end of the block and I head to the far end so we can start working towards each other. I get down there doing my thing when suddenly I hear screaming, yelling, swearing and a lot of bad, all in a female voice. Now the lady I worked with was not a swearing person and I had never seen her angry and this person was angry. I tried yelling back to see what was wrong to receive no answer. Then my partner radios me to find out what's wrong, as she can hear this on the wind. I had to explain to her that it wasn't me either. We decided to work together that day. It never quit until the helicopter came back and dropped off a load of our guys to help us finish off our block. Just before they landed, we heard a couple of quads speed away in the bush. We ended up with about 15 people on that block to help finish it. The helicopter flew around to find the person to see if they were in need of help, but could not even see a trail out of the block. The roads were thorough, pure muskeg swamp, and not passable by foot due to standing water and quick mud. And saying that one is my creepiest, I have even been shot at, had a pack of wolves track me for hours after killing something in my block, been stalked by bears and found dead animals, including one that was gutted and dropped so close to the driver's door of our truck that we had to crawl in from the passenger side, and my poor co-worker that I had needed to phone RCMP for one day as he had to come back to the office freaked out because he found a couple of pairs of skeletal feet in running shoes one day. Turns out after some investigation, someone had shoved bear paws in shoes, which just begs the question, why? At least they weren't human. This was in British Columbia, at the start of the feet washing up on shore of the coast too. I was a parks officer for a downtown metropolitan out in the Pacific Northwest. I saw my fair share of weird stuff on my 5pm to 1am shifts, whether it be naked bike rides after parties at midnight, with about a thousand or so naked people chilling out, the occasional couple going at it, a homeless guy attending to himself or perhaps shooting up, as well as the occasional dead body was all a part of the normal job. This one night, we were sent to investigate a tent set up relatively near the waterfront, which was generously a homeless person that was trying to stray dry for the night. So we get there around 11.30 and tell the lady inside that she has to go a few hundred yards away to an area that isn't patrolled. She fusses and complains about having to move, then mentions a man living in a cave at the bottom of a shallow ravine nearby that has been killing small animals and eating them. We ask her for more information, and she points to a general area about 50 yards away through some thick brush, the general area most people wouldn't wander past. My partner and I started to walk through the thick brush with just our flashlights, and eventually stumble upon the ravine. And sure enough, there's a small opening on the side, enough for a person to fit in. I scale down about 20 feet, and peek inside the opening, and see what looks like a massive pile of magazines, torn pages, article of clothing, 
a sugar cookie tin, a gorilla costume hand, some crude looking tools including a makeshift bow, a few knives and other generally weird stuff. Being curious and that the cave was empty, I opened the sugar cookie tin and found large amounts of what seemed to be raw animal meat. At this point I was thoroughly freaked out and decided to unask the area and informed the police of what I had found, as we didn't carry weapons. We never found what came of the guy who was staying there, or what was going on, but it was definitely freaky at midnight, in pitch black conditions. I was a park ranger and wildlife officer in a mountain state. I don't want to give out too much info due to high tourists and co-workers I still talk to, but the area I worked in had campsites and cabins. One night on patrol, at approximately 11.15, I got a call from dispatch about one of the cabins calling in saying something was outside harassing them. There were not too many people in the area, and it was mid-spring, and there was still some snow on the ground in some parts. Anyway, I arrived on site a few minutes later, in order to reach the cabins, you have to walk up a dirt path for about 25 to 30 yards from when you park your vehicle. Surrounding the trail and cabins is all forest. As I walked up the path, I had a very, very strange feeling of being watched and my anxiety was going up. I arrived at the small cabin to see the fire pit was still smoldering and lanterns and flashlights were moving around inside. I walked up the steps and knocked on the door, identifying myself. The door slowly opened up, and a lady that appeared to be in her late thirties answered. I asked her what was going on. She walked inside fast, and was going on about the kids and the window. I came inside, and noticed another lady around the same age and a few children ranging from ages five to nine, all of them wearing a look of utmost terror. The younger kids were crying. Both mothers were on full-on mum alert. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's the look and attitude of, I'll kill what tries to get my kids. She told me herself and friend's husband were up north on a hiking trail to fish in a lake and camp as they stayed at the cabin with their younger kids. When the kids were playing a game on the floor and the mothers were talking, when they heard the kids screaming and crying, the sound of horror, not she took my toy kind of cry. Both women ran to the children to see what happened. One of the older kids there said there was a big, dark man who was looking at them through the window and tapped on it. The lady pointed to the area and I walked up to it. The oldest son told me it was up there and pointed to the top right corner. I took down the description from both mothers and children and went outside to check the area. As I walked around, I had my 40 caliber in hand, ready to go because I was freaked out and still had the feeling of being watched. I yelled out to the park law enforcement officer who was out there as I shined my flashlight around. I went up to the window to see if there were any tracks, footprints or a ladder indentation, thinking maybe it was a perv watching the kids. These windows were at least eight plus feet off the ground, but I didn't see a track nor a scuff mark in the dirt. I walked about 10 yards into the woods, looking for anything out of the ordinary. The only thing that was noticeable was my uneasy feeling. I went back and informed the family. I saw some game trails and played it cool, as I could say it was most likely a black bear, and gave my wildlife lecture on bears, people, food and spring. I know the mothers saw right through me, but it calmed the kids. I went out to the porch with one of the ladies who asked if I had any idea what it was. I told her no, that I was stumped, but that I would be in the area until my shift ends and that I would pass it on to the other officers 
and to call back if there was another incident. I went back to my patrol truck in a speed walk, almost a jog, and called my dispatcher and the gate officers and informed them of what happened, saying I think it was a bear. I went to my personal truck, where in the back seat, in a locked gun box, I had my 4570 and kept it with me for the remainder of the shift. I have a degree in biology. I don't believe in Bigfoot or Sasquatch and have spent most of my life outdoors. I've had my fair share of run-ins with bears, mountain lions, bobcats, coyote, deer, elk and moose to name a few. I've dealt with aggressive bears on and off my job from Alaska to the lower 48. Nothing has given me as much fear, not even a deployment to the Middle East when I was in the army. I told my supervisor the whole story, knowing I won't seem crazy to him because he was a good friend. I was worried that my co-worker would think some little woodland creature came and spooked me in the woods at midnight, but he gave me his two cents and said he believed me and that it could have been a Sasquatch. Like I said, I don't really believe in any of that. I've never seen any evidence for myself and to this day still have no idea what that was. The only thing I can say is to always carry a weapon when you go out into the woods because you never know what's watching you. I used to work as a fire spotter in a remote tower deep in the woods. On any given day, I would be the only human being for miles. For a couple of weeks, every time it approached sunset, when I'd finished for the day, everything would go eerily quiet, almost like clockwork. It stood out as it wasn't normal. There's usually more noise around that time of day, along with every time I left the cabin to climb down, there was the unnerving feeling of being watched. But for a while, it was only while climbing down. After that, I started getting the same feeling while on the ground, and it somehow felt much closer. I can only liken it to knowing you're being hunted slash stalked. Not overly great when it's a hundred meter walk back to the car with nothing to put between you and whatever else might be out there. This continued on for another week until I started hearing sorts of chirps and calls. They stood out and everything was dead quiet. Then one day, Walking back across the clearing to the car, there was a long, low, guttural growl somewhere behind me, and I noped out of there as fast as I could, and afterwards started parking the car at the base of the ladder, because screw walking around open with angry sounding, probably bitey things lurking around. A few days later, I was driving back out and spotted a movement on the upside of the road, looked again, as it disappeared into the tree line, large, long and dark. It seemed to hang around until the end of the fire season, as the quietness and airy feelings were gone at the start of the next. One of my best buds from college was a geologist major that ended up becoming a ranger in Southeast US. Haven't spoken in years, as is the case with age, but I remember about eight or nine years back, he was telling me about an old married couple that he had recently helped out. He had seen them coming to the park several days in a row and found out where they were visiting us from and that they had gotten engaged there decades prior. They had been searching for a spot they'd taken pics of where he popped the question, but were having trouble. After looking at the pics and figuring out roughly where they were trying to get to, he escorted them in his vehicle, then hiked with them to where he thought it would be. They found it, and he left and went back to his station at the entrance. He said he got a weird feeling once he got back, and felt like he needed to wait to see them whenever they left. Well, once it came to lock up for the night, he still hadn't seen them, so he reported it, left his assistant to wait at the shack at the entrance, and went back to where he left them. He found both of them lying down, spooning along the bank of a river. Neither were alive. He called the cops, went through the nine yards, and went home. The police were able to disclose to him their identities. Later, he learned that the wife was terminally ill with cancer, and they had both committed suicide by ingesting some sort of chemical-slash-pill combination medley. 
They just chose to do it where they had gotten engaged at. My buddy wasn't torn up about it. He was obviously sad for them dying, but said that he thought they hadn't asked for his help earlier because they didn't want to think anyone had helped kill them. My dad is a forestry technician, and this happened to one of his co-workers. They were up doing some sort of job in the very most northerly part of Ontario. Anyway, it was in the middle of the night, and she was half asleep and vaguely heard something outside her tent. Then she felt something push against her tent, and the zipper slowly open. She opened her eyes and saw the head of a polar bear in her tent, Polar bears are far from the cuddly toys you see, and they are known to be super aggressive and will hunt and eat people. She laid there paralyzed with fear, thinking that was the end, and then slowly, the bear attracted its head and left. I worked for a few months as a park ranger with the Florida Forest Service at my local state forest. The creepiest thing I saw was a poor young man who had hung himself on my second week in the job. The unexplainable, though, are obviously not as cut and dry. We have children's clothes neatly folded and left on the trails, pairs of shoes in the middle of our dense burn blocks, and just a general sense of airiness. My first few weeks on the job, I was easily spooked, but after I got into my groove of spending hours alone in the woods, it took a far bit more to shake me. When the forest goes silent, it's best to pack up and move along. I spent a summer in Wyoming, going to BLM land and other remote locations collecting data on bats and herptofauna. I heard a lot of weird noises like mountain lions screaming, deer snorting, and what sounded like owls fighting. I woke up one morning to find two bull moose sleeping 20 yards behind my tent. All of this was part of my job, until one night a truck was driving towards us when we were on a BLM square in the southwestern part of the state. The truck was going over land, no roads, and was slowly driving at us. It stopped about 100 yards away, turned off the lights, and we could see a person get out. They walked a full circle around us at around 100 yards, got back in the truck, and turned around. This was after dark, and this shadowy figure did a complete circle around us. You could hear them walking through the sagebrush, and I'm sure they could hear us talking. We packed up after that, and drove to a hotel an hour away. I called the office, and told them I was taking a gun when we went back out. Didn't like having the bear mace as our only defense. By the way, BLM stands for Bureau of Land Management. I was hunting in public land with my dad, several miles from anything close to a trail. So the day goes by and not much is going on. The weather is crap and I'm not hearing distant gunshots. So I reckon the deer aren't moving much. I radio to the old man that I'm going to head back and we make plans to rendezvous where we had split up that morning. Twenty or so minutes later, I was kneeling around the edge of a pond, stripping off all my bulky camo layers. I was just messing around putting stuff in my bag while I listened to my earphones. I can't remember if I had taken my blaze orange hat off or not to remove my pullover, but I had all the appropriate gear to denote myself as a hunter in my possession. As I was digging through my bag, I thought I heard that faint bass of someone yelling. So I took an earbud out and noticed that crouched on the opposite end of the pond, there was a lone forest ranger watching me. I stood up but didn't wave, and wasn't sure if he had even yelled to me in the first place, so I didn't holler anything to him. We just kind of locked eyes for what felt like a few minutes. To be clear, we weren't doing anything illegal. My rifle was unloaded by that point, though slung over my shoulder, obscuring the fact the action was open, and were following all laws and regulations. I hunched back over to my bag, pulled out my walkie and radioed my dad. We've got company. My motives weren't nefarious. I just didn't want my dad to come blumbling down the hill 
and be surprised by a friendly law enforcement officer. When I looked back up, 15 seconds later the ranger was gone. I mean he was flat out gone. So eventually I met back up with my dad and started to tell him what happened. He just replied, yeah, as deep back here as we are, he probably thought we were up to no good and hit the trail when he saw you hit a radio. They get ambushed like that. As someone who gets nervous and anxious around cops, it never occurred to me that it could be causing them similar anxiety too. If the worker is hearing this now, I'd like to offer you my heartfelt, my bad, and to keep up to good work. I'm a forester of the US Forest Service in Northern California. I've never had anything supernatural happen to me, but it always creeps me out a little when I come across a kill site from a mountain lion. When you're by yourself or in the woods, you're just another link in the food chain, but you don't really think about it until you come across a half-eaten deer and realize a huge cat killed this thing with its face. The strangest thing I've seen would be the time I thought I was about to see a plane crash. As usual, I was working alone on a remote hillside and I saw a plane, like a full-size commercial plane, flying below the ridgeline between mountains. I thought it was gonna crash for sure, but it didn't. It just weaved through and kept going. I thought it was weird to not have any logos or writing on it. And then I come to find out we're close to an Air Force base and they were training pilots for Afghanistan. And this was not a totally uncommon thing to see in the area. I'm a woodland firefighter in the US. I fought fires all over the Northwest, Eastern Rockies, and Midwest forests. And the only thing that's ever thrown me off was fighting fires in the mountains of Northeast Wyoming, on the Bureau of Land Management's land east of Yellowstone. Hiking into a recently burnt valley that was just eerie. Smoke can make that a norm, but the colors were so vibrant even after being touched by fire. Most of the trees and shrubs were unburnt, uncommon but not rare or impossible. Within a few steps of entering the base of the valley, I knew the details like I had lived there all my life, like deja vu, but with the clarity of reality. And not a momentary second, but 20 minutes and 100 yards of hiking. To be clear, this was a place I'd never been to before, and I was hiking paths that were familiar to me as a brother. Trees I knew, scars opposite me of 20 yards away. Stones that were going to be warm, almost hot to the touch, perched inches from an ice cold stream. Before I turned corners, I knew about a rock shelf that was protecting a small pool with a lush green patch of grass the size of a small room with small untouched trees. Green grass in Wyoming in August is fairly uncommon and I stayed there for a moment that felt like an hour. The whole time my hairs were standing up and falling down like I was revisiting a favorite song and the symphony of emotions like nostalgia, joy and bliss were just washing over me. Everything felt perfect, every single detail. I finished scouting the valley, went back to my crew and we moved on. I kept it to myself, not knowing how to explain this perfect place to everyone, let alone myself. This shook me for days. I had no way to rationalize it, and it kept me awake a few nights for the rest of the assignment. Even as we worked, ate, shared fun stories, it still gnawed at me. To this day, four years and countly fires fought later, I've never had an experience like it, and likely the only place I've ever desired beyond any to return again just to touch that perfect part of the world. I've worked in Canada's north for a few years now, in oil and gas. It's pretty creepy when during night shift you realize a moose has just been standing at a tree line staring you down for an unknown length of time, or finding bear tracks crossing the tracks you made five minutes ago. Honestly, the silence of a snowy forest in the dead of night, hundreds of kilometers away from anything is pretty spooky. When your only contact to the outside world is a radio channel no one's listening to, you feel pretty alone. One of the places I go hiking to a lot is a state park. 
it's not very popular, and most of the trails are overgrown. But thanks to this ranger there, there are a ton of trails, and none are so bad that you can't duck and go about your way. I see him all the time, and that in itself is strange. He'll show up 10 feet in front of you on a straight path. He's just there. So I see him all the time hiking and usually coming in and out. We've gotten friendly. I'll usually bring an axe and bow and saw, and he'll just tell me which trails could use some clearing and off I go. So this one day, we do our routine, I sign the book and that, I pack up and head off the trail and see what I can do to clear it up a bit. For me, it was a normal regular hike, nothing special at all, except that I made a small campfire, roasted a few hot dogs and had a few beers for lunch. All in all, it was a wonderful relaxing day. On the way back, the ranger sees me and leads me to his office. I've never been in it, but he's acting nervous as hell and shows me a registration book and my name was crossed out, like I had signed out. He asked if I noticed anyone and I said I hadn't. He just kind of said, oh, okay, and that was it, and told me to go on. I never did figure out what happened or why he was so on edge. I would have written it off, but now when I see him, he doesn't talk much and has always had an excuse to leave. He's still an odd ranger, even by backpacking standards, no matter what loop I do or trails I take, I see him at least twice. He's always going the opposite way each time. I can try and explain some other interactions I've had with the ranger on the trail. I swear to God, he's either the fastest hiker known to humanity, or there's some stuff I can't explain. And no matter where I am in True Park, it's not that huge. I run into this guy coming towards me always. I used to spend a lot of time in the forest near my neighborhood. It's a small strip of trees. Its biggest inhabitant is a fox. I got into vulture culture slash taxidermy about a year ago. I've always been a fan of zoology and being able to look at animals in different ways is incredibly interesting. When I was getting into it, the fox in the forest had just had kits and was hunting overtime to feed them. I started kind of an exchange where I'd pick up bones and such from around the den, and if I found fresh corpses somewhere, I'd leave the meat around the den instead of wasting it. Unfortunately, this garnered me the reputation of outcast slash horrible dead animal lady from most of the kids who liked to play in the forest and noticed me carrying bags of rotting animal parts around. As far as I'm aware, none of them actually knew anything about me, aside from the rotting meat and the time I accidentally busted through where a bunch of snakes live. So that should pretty well cement their opinion of me. Hey guys, it's Mort here. Thank you so much for listening. My voice has gone a bit funny because it is tired. Um, also, I wanna, I wanna get your opinion on the merch. If you like it, if you don't like it, if it can be improved, you know, just leave it in the description. It's always helpful. I'd like to say that um, this video was a bit of a pain to make because Reddit was giving me errors when trying to load the stories. Error 503, that's always nice. And yeah, it's, um, it's been a bit of a, bit of a task finishing this video. But I hope you guys enjoyed it. A huge thanks as always to my amazing members and patrons whose names can be seen on screen for your continued support. It really does mean a lot. Thanks guys. But for now, stay awesome. I'll see you in the next one.